This is Eruri, where epic comes in many forms. Nine mountain ranges, coastline for miles, acres of dense forest. Millions are drawn to this part of North Wales every year. But this is a wild landscape. Hello! Where the best day of your life can quickly become the worst. Police emergency, how can I help? There's a little boy trapped in the mountain. And when a call for help comes in, the busiest network of rescue agencies in the country must join forces. How did you get here? Professionals and volunteers, side by side. Keep going. Each team bringing vital skills and local knowledge. Helicopter inbound. Of how to save a life in a landscape like no other. Two casualties from life changing injuries. Life is good when people help each other. When the more severe jobs come in, you've got to switch on and be able to do the job properly. In Aruri's most inaccessible spots, the Coast Guard helicopter can be the quickest way to get help to badly injured casualties. But it's not without its risks. We get to go flying in weather that you wouldn't drive a car in. You know, you're always considering uh, the patient first, but yeah, we need to know that we can get in there and out safely, otherwise there's no point. The Glyderau Mountains. Their name is thought to come from the Welsh word Clydair, meaning a heap of stones. It's easy to see why. This is one of just a few ranges in the UK with a loose, rocky scramble to get to the peaks. And they attract many an adventurous climber. There's always like three of us, Leon, Rachel and myself. And we've been walking for years together. We always knew what we were doing. Me first then, mate, then Big Al, to catch us when we fall. It was June when Glenn, Rachel and Leon <laughs> travelled to the Gladeri Mountains. The day was going great, all smiles, laughs. This is Leon's perfect day, isn't it? <laughs> Climbs up to the top, the weather starts to get a little bit heavier. Gosh, I like it moody. If you're scared of the weather, you know, you don't go to Wales. It's always good to have that little bit of fear. Not too much. There's the uh, ridge now. So. As the weather's getting worse, they decide to take the quickest route back, along a grip bin. Don't this though, don't it? I like it. Gribbon Ridge, the best way to describe it is rugged. It's like a massive staircase if you were a giant. Be careful. The rock on it is quite loose, and there was a lot of water under the rocks because it had been quite a wet season. Make sure you're always gripping, Rich. Always gripping. No, oh, yeah, I just want you to do so. So where do you reckon now? Probably gets about a quarter of the way down. Ground was really loose. It was moving quite easy. Right, Rich, you go. Leon, you stop there and then get out there. Then. Where's the next break? I said to Rachel, I said, don't stand on that. I don't think she heard it because it was a little bit windy. The whole area 
moved. I fell backwards. I see Rachel going over, like, <gasps> where's she gone? See Rachel literally on her hands and knees. <gasps> so, you know, I'm panicking, thinking, oh, she might have hit her head, but she was moving, so then I thought, where's Glenn? A massive rockfall has left Glenn pinned under this huge boulder. This rocks fell on his back and sandwiched him. There's his head and his one arm hanging out at this massive rock. There's blood coming out of his eyes, his nose, his mouth, his ears. One eye was bulging out that much in there. It looked like it was going to pop out. I couldn't breathe, and it was like I needed to clear my chest. I could feel blood. And I could feel myself boom, going in and out, in and out, so consciousness. I remember Rachel to the side of me, just shouting, don't die. This rock was just not moving. And I was, you know, trying, pulling him, lifting the rock. And I'm just about to give up. I remember just grabbing his ankle. He moved about an inch. This is what I think saved my life. Getting a big breath of air. I just yanked him and he come out. I was like, wow, he's out. I was just looking, and I thought, I'm alive. <clears throat> OK. It's still fresh. Still think about it. I don't think Leon thought I was going to make it. I wouldn't have made it if it wasn't for it. Glenn needs urgent medical help, but their only working phone was crushed in the rockfall, and Rachel's injured too, so Leon must make the two-hour journey to raise the alert. I went, Leon, you don't just stay with me. No, it's, it's my best friend. Do a leave, to run down to get help, do a stay, and just hold my friend's head while he basically dies under this rock. and said, listen, I need to get that. I need to go down this mountain to get help as quick as possible. Seconds were hours. I remember sitting there and it was like coming up to maybe two hours. And I thought I was gonna die. I got really cold, but I was shaking that much. I see one car going past and waving at them and I could see the whites of this poor guy's eyes. He's with his family and you know, he's seen like, Man full of mud and blood and everything could run and swaving at him. He, he just went. I don't blame him, you know. I'd probably do the same thing if it was my family, but just as I come out of the, where the visitor centre section is around the corner, this guy comes off the toilet and he stood, stands on this wall with his phone, his hand up in the air going, I've got it! And he gets reception for an emergency signal. North Wales police answer the call and dispatch the nearest mountain rescue. The Coast Guard helicopter is also alerted, as conditions mean it won't be easy for them to get there quickly on foot. The weather was absolutely atrocious, hoping that the Coast Guard helicopter would be able to assist. The visibility was almost non-existent. It was a pretty bad day out. But we'll always go and look. If we just say, oh, we can't do it, it could be an eight hour carry off and then a journey to hospital in an ambulance and by which time it could be too late. Suddenly I hear <laughs> and I just see this helicopter and I'm having just this relief just going <laughs> The helicopter airlifts a mountain rescue team as close as they can get to the ridge. We managed to get all the way up to them. They fly Rachel, who's also injured, down the mountain. She didn't want to really leave. She was hyperthermic. But I remember saying, Rachel, go to the helicopter. Meanwhile, the rescue team assess Glenn's life-threatening injuries. The guy needed to be in hospital as soon as possible. 
but the weather conditions are going to make winching Glen out by helicopter a very challenging operation. It is absolutely terrifying prospect to try and hover a 12-ton helicopter. They use what they can see outside to maintain the hover. And when there's not much of that, it's very, very difficult. We had to winch at height. Of course, if you're sitting in the hover in a helicopter and you move the aircraft a little bit, the 90 kilo guy on the end of the wire moves a lot more. You're like a big pendulum. I seem to remember the winch operator saying there was about 275 feet of cable out. So I did start to get quite a bit of a swing on. I remember him going a bit to the left. I was thinking, oh, he's nowhere near me now. Back to the right. He was swinging back and forth in an extreme arc. There was a fairly significant risk to him thumping into the mountainside if he got it wrong. We all know we're in this situation. We all know that it's very, very dangerous. You're not thinking about your own personal safety because there's too much else to think about. It's not bravery or anything. You're worried about the person you're about to rescue. And if they're really bad, I've got to try and keep them alive until we can get to the hospital. And then I hear them going, are you ready to go up? There's not much time to hang around, so then it's stretcher on, me on, and away we go. It was great, he was just talking to me and he was just reassuring me it was going to be all right. He was brilliant, something I won't forget. The only time I worry is normally when we're coming up to the aircraft. You start thinking about other things, you know. Why is it going so slowly? You know, get me in this aircraft, please. Once we were clear a cloud, just fly off to Bangor Hospital. It's 10 minutes by helicopter in a situation where every second counts. I broke my back, I had to get my hand rebuilt. I had a crack in my pelvis. On the day of the accident, the nurse come in and she said to me, are we okay to take pictures of your eyes? The pressure from the rock bulged my eyes out. Not many people survive. We haven't got evidence of this. What surprised me is I got off it alive. I'll tell you what was funny, though. There was people saying, rest in peace on Facebook before it even got off the ridge. <laughs> I hadn't even died. It was all about the teamwork. That whole thing came together because everybody did their job well. Without them, I wouldn't be here. They were the heroes. But the Coast Guard helicopter can't help with every emergency. We probably do somewhere around 300 to 350 jobs a year. Sometimes, actually, you start to get in there and then you go, well, hang on a second, should we really be doing this for a twisted ankle, for example? And actually, where there are other options to get that person off the hill when it's very dangerous. Erurys Mountain Rescue teams are the busiest in Britain handling hundreds of call-outs a year. And they must often work alone to find the best way of getting lost and injured people back to safety. Llyn Idwal, a beautiful lake not far from Ogwen Valley Mountain Rescue's base. It's a nature reserve. It's an area of outstanding national beauty, so lots of people go to visit it. A holidaymaker called Susan 
has slipped while walking on the lower slopes around Llyni Dwell. Her knees popped out. She said dislocated. Never happened before. I don't know whether it's a knee dislocation or kneecap. And at the moment, she's shuffling down on a bottom down this fence line towards the lake. A team including Mo and Dr. Jamie is sent to help. So if you if you fully dislocate your knee joint, that would be a pretty pretty unpleasant injury. Just whereas lots of people get dislocated kneecaps, the kneecap can pop out of joint, pop over to the side of the knee. It'd be very, very painful, and often it'll just pop back in of its own accord or it's easy to push back in. It might be that we can get it to walk off, it might be that she has to be stretched and carried up. Having a doctor on the mountain rescue team is really helpful. There's obviously a much more in-depth amount of knowledge that can be given to the casualties. OK, and we're just walking up to Idwal now. We'll give you a shout when we make contact with the cars over. Someone who's hurt their leg and they can't walk, there's only three options. One is give them some pain relief and maybe they find they can walk. The second one is that we get a helicopter. But the last option is we'll have to put them in a stretcher and carry them off from where they are. And if that happens, that takes a huge amount of people and resources. Yeah, all you base, we've uh, found them over. It's Jamie, Hero, and Robin. Hello. Um, this is a regular dislocation. No, it never happened before. Never happened before. No. It feels very weak. Is it painful to walk on, stand on? Yeah. It just, it's a, it feels like a weakness. If we it's, strap yeah. it, do you think you'd be able to weight it then with some poles to hobble off, or do you think yeah. it's, you yeah. need to be sort of carried on? No, no, no. Okay. The knee wasn't dislocated when we arrived, whether it had popped back in or maybe twisted it. That's the, that's the technique, who knew? <laughs> and she was adamant that she really wanted to just kind of get herself out. We can try and strap it and keep it held over this way. OK. Um, and then generally just wrapping a sort of fairly snug um, band to on top of that. Sorry, trousers. <laughs> Susan is determined to try and walk back. So the team strap her knee to see if she can manage it. Give this a fair go. Yeah. If you are still really, really sore and we're having to stop every few minutes to get you down there, we will call the guys to carry you down. So okay. I think that would be a That's sensible fine. thing to do because yep. you're just putting yourself through unnecessary pain. Feels much better with the strap. But it's not an easy walk down. The ground is rocky and uneven. So they call a stretcher party as a backup plan. It's like this all the way down, so if you're finding this hard, it's totally OK for us to grab the stretcher out and... If you dislocate your kneecap because you've stretched all the things around it, it'll be painful after it's gone back in as well, so it can still limit people and stop them from walking. It can be extremely painful. Do you want to have a pause in a minute? Yeah, right. yeah. How about we stop on this big flat rock here? It became quite apparent that this was actually causing her quite a bit of pain. Sorry. And so we decided that it probably was actually best for her to go in the stretcher. Have a seat if you want. Oh. Going in the stretcher for this lady was probably the best option. It was quicker, it caused her less damage to her knee. Although it might have been a little bit embarrassing, it actually probably was the most comfortable ride down off the hill for her, really. Are you happy with that? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> happy's an interesting word right now. <laughs> One, two, three, lift. Let's go. So we start off by carrying it with these straps. Oh, 
Then when you get to terrain where you don't need to carry but you can slide it on the grass, we actually do some sledging. So essentially people at the front are pulling it and just sliding it along the, the grassy terrain. And the people at the back are acting as a brake. Two hours after she called for help, Susan is back at the car park. I think she was a bit disappointed it's cut her holiday short, but um, at least we got her down and she can go and have a cup of tea or a glass of wine or something tonight. mountain rescue groups have existed since the 1930s. Today, six groups cover Eruri, but the organisation still relies on volunteers who want to help their fellow walkers. The origins of mountain rescue comes mostly from climbers rescuing climbers. From then, it's gone on to just people in the outdoors willing to help other people in the outdoors, whether they're an elite instructor doing something at the top of the game or um, someone the first time just going for a walk and having something unfortunate happen. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to we are mountaineers going out and looking after other mountaineers. And with Aruri getting busier every year, this approach has never been more important. We've got a party of two, uh, father and son, uh, and they've called for our assistance to help them off. Their visibility is pretty poor, so quite damp, a little bit colder than what it has been the last couple of weeks. A father and son are lost near Trevan's summit on a wet August day. With the mountain covered in fog, a wrong turn could have deadly consequences. So a team needs to get to them as soon as possible. ได้ยอมันกามาปุสิเตยามมีโนโปกามุเกโนเนสุโดกิโดกิโดกิตายอบากามาปุสิกูเนยามมีโฮกาสุติกินิอายานาริยาไกไกไกอามิ Poor visibility always makes navigation a bit of a challenge, and particularly on Trivan. Foggy conditions mean progress is slow, but by good chance, the team aren't the only ones out on Trevan. So we were walking down the North Ridge and I saw two lads that appeared out of the mist, sat down, hunched over, and the dad said, if you see a mountain rescue team, send them our way. Chris and Jenny, climbers visiting from Yorkshire, realise they're in a position to help. They were cold. They'd clearly been stopped for quite a while. And the dad explained that his son was just exhausted and couldn't, couldn't walk any further. We often say in mountain rescue, it's not the injury, it's the environment that can cause the problems. Um, and actually, these pair weren't injured in any way. 
but the fact that they weren't moving in what was becoming very cold conditions, they could easily succumb to hypothermia. It became quite apparent that we were going to be able to help them. Good news is we've got some food, we've got some warm clothes, we can get you comfortable. Do you know roughly whereabouts you are? Because our guys are underneath you at the moment. Yeah, can you ask us to give us a grid ref? The couple that they bumped into know what they're doing and know where they're going. Great that the mountain rescue team are on their way, but we don't know how long they're going to be. What would be brilliant now that you've got an extra jacket on and you've had some food is if you can stand up and walk towards the rescue team. No matter how far, just let's get moving. A guy called Chris, uh, and he's happy to bring them down the hill himself, uh, down that way, over. Yeah, Roger. Yeah, Roger, Chris, you're on the way. With such limited visibility, the mountain rescue team rely on regular radio updates from base. Hi, Jed. Uh, we've had uh, more comms with the casualty now. Um, the party they are descending with are going to head down towards Piccadilly Circus. From Piccadilly Circus, they're going to hang a left down Milestone Buttress, below Milestone Buttress, and then down to the car park at the bottom. Just keep descending, and uh, you should see how it goes pretty soon, actually. But then, they hit a problem. Uh, 208, no, we've lost comms for the casualty. We will keep trying, but we've lost comms at the moment, over. It's the worst possible time to lose contact with the casualty, as they're near a notoriously dangerous part of the mountain. Waterfall Gully. It's quite a horrible climb, and we have gone to a lot of incidents of people falling from here. So we're just going to hold it just in case um, the two decide to come down this way and we can stop them before that happens. Poor weather on Trivan can be really disorientating, it can be really confusing, and if you're already feeling very tired, uh, very worn out, that can cause problems. The team wait for Chris, Jenny and the casualties at the gully, just in case they get themselves into a dangerous situation on the way down. Yeah, we're going to wait around about the waterfall gully area, uh, just in case. Not hey. We were almost down the side of Marstone Buttress, and then we heard some voices shouting up from, from the mist. This way! Chris! Yeah. Come on, chickens. The cast party, they're about 50 metres above us and they're walking towards us on the path, over. All copy, base out. Hello. Good evening. Good evening to you too. How's everyone yeah. doing? <laughs> Much better. Well done, team. Good work. Good. Very good. There's some more warm layers and things here. It was great to kind of lay eyes on them and to see them and, yeah, to check them over and make sure they were OK. Well done, well done. No, it wasn't me, it was old Chris. <laughs> We've come up from the other side. Who's the mountain girl? Oh, I can see the, the road. Oh, bloody hell. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's just there. Uh... We didn't stop for too long. We just wanted to keep them moving in the right direction and get them down off the mountain. And today won't be the last time Chris helps make a difference in the mountains. Since that day on uh, on Triven where I helped out uh, Oggy uh, Mountain Rescue Team, I have started my what's called pre-probationary period with my local mountain rescue team. It feels really special being able to, to use your expertise to help people out, um, and I think that he enjoyed that on that day, and, and we as a team are really grateful to him for helping out. Where have you come from? Have you come from...? Oh, well, our base is just down there, especially on that long stretch. Oh, yeah, you're in Capsule's opposite. Uh... He's obviously got the bug for, for that excitement and that feeling of giving back, um, so it's fantastic. <laughs> 